Welcome everyone. My name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at SOAS, University of London. And today's webinar for the Linguistic Department will be in an interview format where our guest will be interviewed by Julia Selabank. For those who have been of you probably already know her, but uh, Dr. Julia Selabank is Professor of Language Policy and Revitalization at SOAS. Her research interests include uh, research on small minority and endangered languages, including language revitalization, language policy and planning from a sociolinguistic perspective. And she's also contributed to international recognition of language revitalization as a field of study and undertaken broader research in the fields of multilingualism, sociolinguistics, linguistic ethnography, and linguistic anthropology. Our guest today uh, for this webinar is Professor Anvita Abbey. Professor Abbey received her Master's of Arts in Linguistics in 1970 from the University of Delhi. She received her PhD in Linguistics in 1974 from Cornell University. She taught at Cornell and Kansas State University before returning to India in 1976, where she joined Jawaharlal Nehru University. And she's since then widely published in the areas of typology, language documentation, minority languages, language policy, and education as well as aspects of ethno-linguistic language use. She's received several high-profile awards for her work, including the Kenneth Hale Award from the Linguistic Society of America and Padma Shri from the President of India. Uh, on a more personal note, Professor Abby kindly agreed to share some of her experience with SOAS graduate students as part of a language document course I was teaching last year. And several of those students said it was a highlight of the course for them. So I know Professor Abby is an engaging speaker and passionate about linguistics. <laughs> and so thank you for both of you for making the time to be here today. I know you're both passionate about this uh, topic, but also very busy. So I appreciate you coordinating your schedule. <laughs> We're here specifically here to talk about Professor Abby's latest publication, <laughs> a book called Voices from the Lost Horizon. This book is a collection of folk tales and songs of the great Andamanese. Voices from the Lost Horizon is a collection of a number of folk tales and songs. Today, the language is a moribund language, uh, breathing its last breath, but these stories and songs are the documentation of verbal arts that were recorded by Professor Abby and her research team that worked with the great Andamans people in the Andamanese Islands. Um, the book brings together 10 rare stories and 46 songs in the language that we'll hear more about today. So thank you for both of you for making the time for being here today. And uh, we look forward to uh, getting to be a part of this discussion with you. Okay, thank you very much, Joey. Um, and welcome everybody. And, and it's particularly nice to see Professor Abby again, if only virtually. Um, we got to know each other, I think nearly 10 years ago when you spent a year at SOAS, uh, when you were preparing the, um, uh, the curation of, of your collection of, of uh, data from the Great Andamanese. And I think at the time you were preparing your book about birds, particularly Birds of the Greater Andamanese, which I think we had a book launch for at a previous occasion. You know, face -to -face yes, and yes, virtually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember vividly, yes, mm -hmm. working together for that. Yeah, so, so your, your, your um, links with SOAS go back some time. So it's really good to welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I have read this book. Uh, I read it this week, and yeah, it's. I really enjoyed it. It's. It's a really nice little book, and yes. it on Kindle, which is really cheap. If anyone's uh, wanting to get a, a good way of getting hold of it, um, it's. It's also really nice that um, I haven't managed to do this myself yet. But you have um, um, QR codes, which yes. is recording yes. of the actual poem of the actual virtual songs, which is it's a really a really nice actual an addition, I think, to the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the idea of the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it just shows what you can do nowadays with digital recording. Yes, the technology has helped you know, us. In. Yeah, the advantages of, of, of doing doing recordings in, in, in language documentation. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days for pen drive and CD-ROM that we used to mm. use with our books. <laughs> My computer doesn't even have a CD-ROM player. Yeah. <laughs> yes, very true. Yeah. Anyway, um, I better get down to this list of questions that uh, we will put together. Um, okay, so um, it's how much time do we have, Julia? Um, I think Maybe? we have thirty to forty minutes for these questions, and and then we'll open up the floor to the audience. Um, okay. How long do we have in total? About an hour and a half? Oh, we'll spend about an hour together total. 
Okay, right. Okay, let, let's let's uh, let's do this quickly, and then we can get our answer. Op open the questions to everybody. So, Anvita, sorry, may I uh, call you Anvita? The um, for those who aren't familiar with the location, can you tell us a little bit about the Andaman Islands, where they are, and, and the people who live there? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> first, let me thank SOAS and the University of uh, London, the department. Joey and Julia to host me and to give me this opportunity to showcase my last, perhaps, I do not know, I think it's one of the last books on Andaman because I have already now brought out all that I could say mm. on this language. And I realized that I have some folk literature, oral tradition material with me. Mm. So I thought I would uh, bring it out. So thank you very much to give me this opportunity to share with my old colleagues what I have to say and to some of my ex-students and current students, as I can see the faces, the quite a few and some members of the SOAS. Okay, the Andaman Islands are rather far, far away from where we are sitting now and any of, any of you I can guarantee. But considering from the Indian subcontinent, there are approximately 324 islands and islets in the Bay of Bengal, running from north to south, very, very uh, <laughs> close to the, you can say, Burma, Myanmar, as you can see on your map. But these are the ones which constitute Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and they are, they are part of the Indian subcontinent. So they are, if you take a flight from Kolkata or from Chennai, they're 1500 kilometers away. I mean, that's the long flight. On the right-hand side of the map, you can see a little enlarged version of the Andaman and the Nicobar Islands. Right now I'm working on the Nicobarese languages, but previously this particular event is for the Andaman. And as I said, there are around 324 islands, are tiny islands, so you can see on the map, but look, look like a landmass. And there is a little, is a tiny little island, straight island, which is 56 nautical miles away from the capital city of Port Blair, where I spent most of my life capturing uh, the Andaman, Andamanese language. This is an aerial view and you can see basically Andaman islands are the jetting peaks of a big, big mountain that is submerged in the sea. So this is, uh, uh, this is where Andaman islands are and this is where I spent my most of my working life on Andamanese languages. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so what, what made you interested in working in the, in, in the Andaman Islands in the first place? <laughs> it's a long story. I had been working on the tribal languages of India uh, when I went back to uh, India after my stint at teaching at Kansas State University. And uh, I started my work to identify the aerial typology. And that's how I was exposed to large number of languages of India. And during that course, I came to know that there are some very ancient civilizations tucked in in Andaman on whom the work has not been done much. I mean, some work was available, but not really in depth. And I must give credit to the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology, where I was a guest scientist in 2000. I just, uh, the director asked me, what is your wish when you go back? I said, I wish I had, you know, small enough grant to do pilot survey on the, in the, on the languages of the Andaman. And he asked me to write a proposal and it was approved. The rest is a history. So this is how I got to do the pilot survey in 2001. And that really opened a new vista for me. And I realized that uh, I have to drop everything and first get to this because the language was on the languages, I should say, were endangered, but primarily the great Indomanis appeared to be on the brink of extinction. And I thought uh, and discussed with my colleagues, but none of them were interested to go to Andaman because the conditions of living are very tough there. They were much tougher there at that time than they are now. And the, the social conditions were also not very, you know, conducive to work. So everybody chickened out, to be very frank. So I realized that I, perhaps I'm the only one, maybe it's meant for me. So I indulged in it and I was encouraged by some of my linguist friends like uh, Johanna Nichols and Anna Malai and others to propose a grant to SOAS, you know, for the ELDP project. 
to work intensively on great tender monies, which I did and luckily I got the grant. And then the net results are in front of you. So I worked on the great tender monies and I got, I was right. I mean, I, I hit a gold, uh, you know, a <laughs> gold, gold uh, mine because I was not aware of the kind of language structures that I was going to be exposed to when I started this work. So I have been very fortunate, I must say. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of segues on nicely. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the languages themselves? This particular book is not really about the languages, it's about the folklore. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very linguistics light for those of you of us who aren't specialist linguists. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit about, about the linguistic background. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, that's an interesting question because uh, uh, most of the people think that if you go to a community, they must be speaking the same language or there's a uniformity. However, when I, uh, I was exposed to the Andamanese people, there were nine speakers at that time. And they were semi-speakers, I should say. I realized that uh, they came from various different clans. So they were not, uh, though there were many intermarriages also. So the, the, the situation was much more complex than I expected. There were four language representative on the Strait Island, which I visited. Uh, the languages, the names were Jero or Jeru, Bo, Khora, and Sare. And uh, there were more speakers of Jeru than other languages. In fact, there was one speaker for Khora, one speaker for Bo, and there was one lady who knew Sare but very hardly uh, used it. And when, you, when I looked into their background, I realized they are the children of intermarriages. So, for example, a uh, let's say a Khoras woman married a, a Jero man and the children spoke Jero and Khora, but ultimately they spoke something else, which was much more communicable to a larger number of people. Or there was another person who was a Sare and she married a, a Jero speaker. So, you know, they, they were, and the children spoke Sare as well as so uh, Jero. So there was quite a few intermixing of uh, uh, the speeches. However, some kind of leveling was arrived and the, the they were communicating whatever little communication, though the domains were very few. Uh, they used to use it more as a code language than interacting for the daily lives. In a, in a common language, which I termed as present day great Andamanese, PGA. And my reason for giving this term to them was I didn't want to empower any of the four languages. You know, if I had called it Sare, if I had called it Jero, that would not have been safe. So what the language is, to, to just in a short, let me describe it, it's basically based on the grammar of Jero. But the lexicon is derived from the old, all four languages. So the dictionary that we compiled has almost 39 to 40% of words from Bo, from Boa Senior. And uh, there are very few words from Sare and Khora because a Khora speaker had almost forgotten the language, but I call it a PGA. So these stories that, and this particular book that we are going to talk about today has 10 stories, which are narrated to me by now junior, whom I call my guru because I learned a lot from him during my stay. And I really miss him till today. He narrated these stories. Uh, initially, he started narrating in Andamanese Hindi. And then he switched when I, he himself realized that he was not doing justice to the story. Every time he used to say, oh, this is not what I wanted to say. Let me think of the Andamanese word. And then he thought of the Andamanese word and then he gave me that word. And I asked him what it really means. And Julia, you'll be surprised to know the language documentation helped him revive the language. A time came when he just wanted to give me the narration in Andamanese Hindi, not uh, sorry, in, in his own language, which was Jero basically. So these stories are uh, actually an evidence of how language gets life, you know. The, from the moment when they said, we don't remember, but I remember any story because we have not narrated any story in the last 40 years. And we have never put our children to bed singing a lullaby or narrating a story, how can we tell your story? From that point to the point, 
when now junior won't leave me even when i was going to the airport to fly back to delhi he said no no you must listen to the story of mine i remembered last night he was so enthusiastic in this documentation project amazing so the the stories in this book are uh, i should say in pga as well as in jero but the songs are mainly from boa senior so they are in bo language and that's the bo somehow was little difficult for the other members to interpret so i had a tough time in asking for translation from the other other members so i had to sit with boa senior and decipher it gradually word by word and you know it took me a lot of time to translate these songs so there are 46 songs in fact we collected more than 65 songs but the other songs i could not translate fully so i have not put them in the book so the book contains songs from bo boa senior and stories from now junior mainly there's one story from boa senior also there are a couple of songs from the modern generation children singing but they are more influenced by the hindi songs so it almost looks like a <laughs> rendition translation however so this is a very unique book if i say maybe this is the 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 very first and perhaps the last a uh, documentation of oral tradition of a very old civilization i won't be wrong because all those all those people who narrated or sang are gone you see and children are not speaking their language and britishers who came it enough in the early 19th uh, late 19th century and early 20th century on these lands uh, did record us uh, short stories or so redcliff brown did for the south andamanese languages these languages i forgot to tell you are are actually were drawn from the north andamanese languages in fact a, a little of a, just a line of uh, in another line of history let me tell you these these great andamanese people were scattered at the time of independence of india 1947 at various places so they're like two uh, uh, the anthropologists tell me dr t and pandit who was instrumental in collecting these people and putting them into strait island he tells me that some people they they had a very uh, melancholy and a very chaotic life they were leading some were begging some were living in the bunkers of burmese army some were living uh, in some forest and some were in maya bandar in the north andaman they were all scattered so he decided to collect all these four different uh, language speakers or the tribes who were interconnected of course uh and put them in a separate island and he says the separate the demand for separate island came from within a tribe by the name of loka who was also considered chief of the andamanis great andamanis he himself said that jarvas have a marked area for them and the ongas have a marked area for them these are the two other tribes of the andaman islands why don't we have a marked area of our land because as it is the whole andaman belong to us but now you have taken over so at least now give us some small piece of land where we can all stay and he convinced all his members to move to dislocate themselves wherever they were from to the strait island so they now live in strait island and this is how they all got together and somehow because of these efforts the i think the tribe survived the language also survived to some extent you see so this is a small little history in the very interesting uh, genesis of this uh, pga as well as the contributors are drawn from as i said from four different mutually intelligible languages you see okay thank you yes i i think you kind of answered the the next two questions already in that case um, well, i'm so sorry <laughs> no, no, no worries no no that's great um missing through here um <clears throat> I, i'm I, and um the question is uh, uh, there's a question about how you can can you explain who still spoke the languages and what happened historically that led the languages to be going out of use but i think actually you've turned that around a bit and you've talked you've talked about how um doing the documentation remembering the stories helped help the people to the people you talk to to try and and uh, and, and remember their languages which i think is is great um what comes through to me especially is your very close relationship with the people that you worked with um and it mm -hmm. is how it's really important to know them and to know their history and and to have a personal relationship so that they trust you you see julia this project lasted uh, from 2005 to 2009 mm -hmm. and uh, there were many occasions i didn't miss a single leave 
or uh, opportunity to visit the island. And uh, they started trusting me. As we all feel linguists, we know when you go for the first time, nobody trusts you because you look different, you speak different, and they see tape recorders and stuff of instruments in your hands which scare them off. All kinds of things. We know what kind of appearance we really carry with ourselves when we go to the field. But gradually when uh, uh, you start learning their language and speaking, even if your pronunciation is not correct, they realize the seriousness about your work. And this is what happened with me to Boa Senior. She just won't leave me. Whenever I would go, she says, when you come, I speak my language. When you go, I don't. And she had no one to speak to. And one of my team members caught her talking to the birds. And when she asked, when he asked, why are you talking to birds? He, she said, well, birds understand me. Nobody else does. And uh, then I asked Boa, I said, we used to call her Chachi. Chachi is a Hindi word for aunt. So I, I called her, I said, Chachi, why do you talk to birds? And she says, don't you know they are our ancestors and they understand me. And this is how I came across a wonderful story of Jiro Mite, which is included in this book. And it is a kind of a creation tale where it tells you that the, the human beings, the Andamanis were originated from birds. Now, this is a little different from most of the stories that we hear as fairy tales or folk tales and Jatak Katha or Panch Tantra or any other. Mostly what happens, it is the animals and the birds become the humans, but here it is just the opposite. And that, has, that really uh, generated a lot of interest uh, in me. So I, I asked now Junior, to, is there a story like that? And he said, yes. And I said, can you narrate to me? He said, I have not narrated that story to anybody for a long time, but let me think about it. And he thought and thought for two days and two nights. And he, he remembered and he came and he narrated this story to me, which is a fantastic story. It is also published individually for children by the National Book Trust of India. And uh, it has been translated in Hindi, English. But the, there's another story which now told me, which is of creation tale. And that's a very fantastic tale, which has been again published also by National Book Trust. And you'd be happy to know it's already been translated in 14 Indian languages. So I would believe the children of India of various different places are reading the creation myth of the great Andamanese. So the, the language, you know, the, uh, where there was no hope when I reached there, it somehow kindled some hope and people started trusting me because I could speak my broken great Andamanese to them or broken bow to them. And I think that that led, you know, the information one after another, the, including the grammar and the dictionary that we could produce and, and the um, ornithological knowledge, the names of the birds, which SOAS actually launched this book in 2011, if I remember. <clears throat> Yes, I remember that one. Thank, thank you, thank you. Yes, no, I, I, I agree that it's, it's, it's possible for us if, it, as by showing interest, by showing that there is outside interest in, in languages and cultures, can actually help to, to create interest in the community as well, and to, to valorize those languages and cultures. Yeah. Um, so, um, this is this is the last question um, for, from from the list, and then we'll go we'll open it up. Um, personally, I think it's a very accessible book. This one, um, can you tell me? Can you tell us? Can you tell the audience for people who aren't linguists or anthropologists what what can they take away from reading this book? Well, you don't have to be a linguist <laughs> to to uh, to get the uh, to get get something from the book because these are. These are very unique stories, you see, which are there in this book. In fact, starting with the very first creation myth, which I just talked about, uh, Perta Jido is the name of the protagonist. He was supposed to be born out of a bamboo stalk, bamboo stalk. Perta Jido, Par is a name of a bamboo. Ta is a genitive uh, or a ablative, both you can say. Uh, suffix and jido is human being to be born of so to be born of a bamboo so the first human being great andamanese thought was born out of a bamboo and this is a story of a 
which actually gives us uh, several metaphysical aspects of life. It's an, a unique story which also connects us to the punch of Huda, the five elements of life, earth, water, sky, fire, and space. So the, this, this was rather interesting for me to understand that, that the Andamanis do perceive and do cognize the Panchabhuta. Not only that, it also talks about the outer world, the outer world. And in fact, is the, I would say that it is the absolute truth that the story uh, propagates or absolute idealism where the consciousness and the, uh, the, the demarcation between the consciousness and the objects completely breaks down. And uh, this kind of absolute truth or absolute idealism also does not uh, believe in seeing what you cannot uh, see. So it, uh, because there are, the protagonist talks about the outer world and he wants to go to the outer world with his uh, partner and snap all the ties to this world. So the kind of a nirvana, you see, which we talk about now, or, is, been, uh, is very much emoted in a very, very ancient story. And similarly, there are other stories which, uh, which actually indicate a kind of a cosmos which includes the, all the three worlds, the world of the sky, the world of the earth, which has forest, or, and the world of the sea. All the three amalgamates into one. And the Andamani see this as a whole. And it's a very holistic projection that these stories really emote. There are very interesting things that uh, the readers would be very fascinated by reading these stories. For example, for the first time, I learned that the great Andamanis is a very egalitarian society because they name their children in the womb. So there is no gen there's a gender equality. There is no name, uh, uh, the, you know, the name particular to a female child or a male child. So Jirake can be both a girl or a woman. Boa can be either a man or a woman. So this is a very interesting uh, phenomena. And the name changes four times in your lifetime. So it depends upon the season that the name of the person changes. So, you know, these are kind of things that are also uh, reflects in the story. The other aspect that I can think of, people will be amused to read from the story is, uh, there's a story called Juro, the headhunter. Uh, she, I realized that there are four different kinds of cremation, depending upon the mode of death. How one a person dies, he is being, the body is disposed of accordingly. And the children are left untouched uh, for one week, and then they are, uh, you know, uh, immersed in the water. So the, there are very interesting aspects of uh, all these, you know, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, comes very life to the, for that uh, the Andamanis had a very different kind of life than the more mainstream India or the mainstream Indians or anybody as a matter of fact, you know. The, there is another uh, aspect of this, um, which I must tell, and I'm sure, Julia, if you've read the stories, you must have struck you that there are supernatural powers, people with supernatural powers. And one of the super, uh, supernatural powers is the power of being cannibalistic in nature. And that's initially what you know bothered me and hurt me because there are a couple of stories which does indicate that perhaps the community had cannibalism. But as you move into the story deeper, you realize that it was... Uh, the cannibalism was invested or it was part of one of those people who had supernatural powers. And anyway, cannibalism was always looked down upon and uh, people were scared of it and they wanted to get rid of it. As you can see, the, even the Juro, the headhunter is a very interesting story where the son realizes that his mother indulges in this practice. And though he's very fond of his mother and the mother is very fond of her, his, her son, Yet he becomes the instrumenting, instrumental in getting his mother killed because he wanted to save the humanity. Because he realized if he, his mother keeps doing this, uh, then one day there'll be no youth uh, left on this island. So there are very interesting stories. In fact, when I heard this story, I told now Junior, I said, how can that be possible? How can a mother who is a mother of a child go to the seashore and you know look for young boys and girls to eat up. So he says, no, but she had a supernatural power and this is what happens. And then suddenly he, he changed the subject and said, 
You also have a goddess Kali Mai, and she wears the necklaces of the skulls around her neck. What do you think she was? And I just got jitters, you know. I said, I do not know. I never thought of it. He says, well, so this kind of practice is being followed in many communities. You do not know. So he was trying to tell me. I, well, I didn't object. I didn't want to. That's one of the lessons one field workers learn that you never contradict your <laughs> speaker. Whatever he says, just absorb. So he had this, he had this uh, because he had seen Kali Mandir in Port Blair. And he realized that the Kali had a similar kind of uh, image that Juro had. So I suppose these are very interesting aspects in these stories that comes out very clearly. And so there are, uh, uh, there are many takers of this book other than uh, just the literature people, because literature people, I'm not a student of literature, but I'm sure when literature people, literary people will read it, they will, but will they'll get much deeper into it and find out more about these stories. But anthropologists, also have a large so, lot to learn from this, you see. And even the songs, songs depict the ancient civil, the, the kind of atmosphere there was in, in ancient times and the feeling of a person. There are also lullabies, you know, I very with great difficulty I collected, I think three, there are three lullabies, but, but it was amazing to know that none of the mothers ever put their children to sleep singing lullabies, nor they sang anything else. So this is how the Andamanese kids unfortunately grew up. So the, the, there, are, uh, there are issues and there are many aspects about this, but linguists would be interested to know that there are five stories for which I've given line to line translation. I did not, I wanted to give interlinear translation, but my publisher thought it will become too technical and maybe people won't buy it. So sometimes you have to go by the, maybe so I just said, this is my last book. Maybe it's not last, I have to, some linguist friends are saying you bring out another book with interlinear translation. So anyway, so there are line to line translations. So you can, you can easily read uh, uh, what, the, the, what the great Andamani sentence really meant one by one. And in fact, it's a, it's the, I have tried to retain the original uh, narrative uh, style. So sometimes, um, and this is what happens when the language is on uh, dying, you know, the, sometimes the, the, the later part comes first and the first part comes later. So there is a, but later, so I have given it as it is, but later some of my literary critic friends still told, tell me this is postmodernism. So for fine, if it's a postmodernism, but sometimes now Junior remembered the last part first and he wanted to tell me that first. And then he said, he gave me the first part later. So I have kept that way, you see, as it is. So the original text is there with, with translation, but uh, there's another interesting aspect of this book, which uh, people would admire, that the songs are also given in Devanagari. They've given in Roman script and they've given in, uh, so that uh, linguists and other people who know anybody, any literate person can read the songs and sing it, but it's also given Devanagari, but I thought that the Andamanese children can read it. Hindi being the state language and Andaman Nicobar, everybody reads Devanagari. So the Devanagari script will be easily read by large number of people within and outside Andaman. And people may can sing, can sing these songs, you see. And then of course, there follows, follows the English translation. So all the three versions are given in the songs. And as uh, Julia mentioned, the, there are QR codes given on the book so you can just, uh, your smartphone, you can scan it and go to the video, which I'm very happy. They're very well produced. And uh, the publisher, I must thank the Niyogi Books that they have done a fantastic job. And they have, they are going to put more and more audios and videos on the website. So you will be able to hear later as and when it uh, adds on, because I, I gave them quite a few songs and uh, the in audio forms and the video forms. Most of the songs are sung by Boa Senior. And as I said, because she was the only one who remembered songs, nobody remembered songs at all. And that also we, we elicited uh, in a very difficult times because when I met her first in 2005, they were moved from Strait Island to a, a relief camp, tsunami relief camp in Port Blair. So everybody was uh, in a very melancholy, atmosphere and they had uh, lost their houses. They had 
they were very depressed and was, that was not the time. It was an antithesis to ask them, please sing a song for us, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, you know, I had to spend, I had to sit with her and listen to her uh, sorrows and woes. And somehow she did, initially she was very irritated. She, she was very irritated by us. And we have the recording where she says in Andamani Hindi that these people come all the time and asking for song and irritate us. Why don't they get lost? And from that, uh, uh, you know, from that kind of attitude to the attitude that when she started singing, because we appreciated a lot, she, I think eventually she, maybe she found out that songs were working as a balm to her pain, you see, because uh, she sang sometimes on her own without ask, without us asking her. And I realized that because she had been constantly, maybe I'm making us sing every day, somehow she's forgetting her woes. So it has been a very eye-opening uh, uh, session for me as a field worker, you see, that how yeah. much we can we can bring back to the society yeah. if we are get interested into them, their lives. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting. And actually, uh, that, that there is more and more research nowadays. Um, some of my colleagues in Poland, um, Justyna Olko, has been doing a work on a project called Language as a Cure. Um, so focusing on, on um, how through trying to remember and, and to revitalize uh, traditional languages, people can overcome some of their historical trauma. Um, mm -hmm. There's some very interesting research going on in, in, that, in that area at the moment. And, mm -hmm. Um, so Joe has been asking in the chat box, anybody, anybody else got any questions? And BJ Souza has come up with one. BJ, would you like to say your question yourself or would you like us to read it out? BJ? Sometimes there are connection problems. Hi, Julia. Uh, Hi, my you? internet connection is not very good. So if you could okay. ask a question, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So your, the question that BJ has put in the chat is that, um, thank you for your work, your inspiring work. He says, the language has been described as one that's breathing its last breath, but is there any hope of revival at all among the young people and children, especially thanks to your documentary work? Uh, thank you, Vijay, for, uh, for attending this and asking this question. If you had asked me this question, uh, let's say a month ago, I would have said uh, no. But just in a month, things have changed. You know, the, when I left Andaman Islands and my frequent visits to the Andaman Islands tell me the children are not interested in learning the language, despite the fact we have uh, scripted the language, we gave the first book of letters so they can read and write the Andamanis. But you see how the <clears throat> indirect subjugation of languages take place when the state language policy or the education policy is not inclusive in nature, one. And when the education policy does not take into account the oral tradition of our community. India has more than 800 oral languages even now, but nowhere ever they figure anywhere. So the revival, uh, revivalism of language is possible only if the community is willing to revive. So what I faced, Time and again, the community was not willing to revive. But I said things have changed in the last one month. I got a call from Anthropological Survey of India in Port Blair from one of the workers that uh, three young people have walked into our office from the Great Indomani's tribe. And they know you because they mentioned your, I'm called Annu Madam there because Anvita is a little difficult to pronounce. So my they call me Annu Madam. So they said, we have known Annu Madam. She likes and loves our language. Please ask her, can we start talking and reading and writing our language? And can you make it possible? And those, I mean, when I got this, uh, this information, it was, uh, it was like my day was made. I was at Bonanza. I said, wow, there is a ray of hope. So now it seems that people are realizing that they need some identity marker. And as Julia would also vouch for this, it is generally the third generation who comes around and wants to learn and revive their language, whether it is the case of Maori, which is a very successful uh, uh, you know, example, or 
you know, I also taught in the British Columbia in um, for last three years. I was a adjunct professor at Simon Fraser University, and I was working with Salish languages and other languages of uh, Hakul, uh, and uh, we worked intensively on Haida. And even some students from Alaska, the, from the community, came to attend my course because they said we want to revive our language, and they said they we they never paid any attention to their parents because parents did not know also much, but the grandparents, yes, they spoke. So it is always the third generation who they want some identity. Identity and I think language serves as a very big ethnic identity. So I think great and the money's children are also come around and they must be realizing now that this is their only ethnic identity which they are losing. So let us hold on to it. So I suppose there is some urge to revive. I do not know whether the language can be revived unless there are large takers because the population base is very small, Vijay. Right now, there are not more than 54, 55 people. And most of them are young children. However, there are still semi, three semi-speakers still left in the community. If they are in, engrossed in teaching, it can be done. And we have already given a talking dictionary, a very comprehensive one, and uh, which Joey can perhaps show the if he's around, he can show the show the uh, image of it. Uh, that was also launched in London, I remember. And uh, we have also full grammar of the language available. There are also other interesting aspects of oral traditions that are available. So if the community wants to revive, it can be revived. There seems to be now a ray of hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gregory, uh, nice to see you as well. Uh, do you want to ask your question yourself? Vikri Haimovich. Okay. I, I, can't, I can't ask it, I, I think, because uh, I'm currently in, in a noisy environment. Okay. So Sorry. I would prefer if you, if you could please uh, read, uh, read it yourself. Okay, thank you, Gregory. Nice to hear you. Um, so Gregory says, thank you again, Professor Abbi. The story of this uh, Landamese languages once inspired me to study endangered languages and language planning. Mm. So he wanted to, wants to ask, are any of the Andamese, Andamese languages currently taught in local schools in some form, or are there plans to organize such teaching? Uh, sorry, Gregory, that I, I really have to regret this, but it is, it is uh, not taught in any of these schools. And uh, this is despite my urge, uh, several urges I made to the administration that I'm willing to write a primer. And when the book of letters was launched, it was launched in a school. I made it a point that the book was formally launched in a school by the education, the state education secretary. And I said that I, at that time I proposed that these should be introduced in school for the Andaman kids also, and for the non-Andamanese kids in Andaman. But somehow government did not uh, take any initiatives. It's not taught anywhere, nowhere, neither in Andaman nor outside Andaman. Very sorry state of affairs. Well, may, maybe if there is more demand in future, then that might be possible at, at one stage. Yes, could be. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, Wachta, Adana, do you want to ask your question yourself? Oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I, I'm audible enough. Yes, you can. You are, yes. Uh, all right. So, um, good e good e good morning from here in the Philippines. So, hello, Professor Abby. I am a teacher from the Philippines, and I really am inspired at the um coverage of your work. So, I from a teacher's point of view, I would just like to ask, um, how can we encourage our schools, our schools administrators, and even the policies to be more inclusive in terms of really um, giving importance and highlighting um, our or reviving our languages? You see, uh, the uh, I'm, good, uh, I'm happy you asked this question because uh, this is a very important aspect of our life that it, this, the languages should be introduced at the school level. You see, I do not know which place or uh, uh, province you come from, but if you have uh, minor languages, the language is uh, minor in the sense that uh, they are only uh, used at home and not uh, part of the school curriculum, they should be introduced uh, as a hobby class to begin with. 
let children practice in spoken phenomena of the language. That's more important. And uh, you know, the if if you can start from there, you don't need much infrastructure for it. You just need a speaker and some uh, rudimentary syllabus about talking about things around your environment. Your how do you cook this or how do you wear this or how do you stitch this? You know this kind of thing. And I think very small subjects one can introduce these languages in the context of India. I always suggest that. The, since our orality is a very strong point, we should introduce these languages in school in oral forms to begin with. And then gradually one can script it if it is not scripted, but if it is already scripted, then introduce the letters and the reading and writing. But right from the nursery class, you can introduce these languages, you see. And there are songs when children can at least sing a song or song, you know, the as it is when kindergarten children's, uh, you know, narrate nursery rhymes, they don't understand much of it. Even the English children going to British school or you know, kindergarten, they don't understand every word of the nursery rhymes, but they, they somehow memorize it. So it's, it's fun to have the different kind of rhythm uh, because every language has a different kind of meters and rhythm, singing pattern. So it would be very nice to introduce from the oral tradition, you see, but one, can, one should do it, it will be fun. Thank you. Thank you. It runs on nicely into the next question from uh, Professor Peter Austin. Peter, would you like to uh, say your question yourself? Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, hi, um, RBG. It's very nice to see you again. <laughs> and congratulations on, on the volume. As you say, it's a, it's a, a conclusion to 20 years of dedicated study to of, of the Andaman uh, languages and people and their cultures and uh, you know we can only just appreciate the the huge amount of work that you have put in um, really much of it I'm sure funded just from your own resources and and time and energy that you've done um, and also uh, please say hello to Satish because I know that he was also a supporter <laughs> of your work and, and did spend some time in Andaman as well. Um, my uh, question is, um, it's really nice to have a book like this and I, I didn't quite understand. It's, it's published in English, I, I gather. Um, mm -hmm. is, there a, is there an Andamani Hindi version of it for local consumption? And particularly um, an audio book version. So something that people could play um, like on, you know, on a mobile device, on, a, on an iPhone or iPad or, or a mobile phone um, or computer. So they don't have to rely on their literacy skills. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if it was, you know, even if it's in, in standard written Hindi, that's mm -hmm. not what people would normally be speaking to one another. So. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about producing an audio version in Andamani Hindi um, for the local people to uh, be able to appreciate. Thank you, Peter, he being uh, to join this and nice to hear your voice after a long time. And I can't even see you virtually because you are not there on the video. But thank you so much for uh, uh, not many people know that Peter had been a big support uh, in this to this project uh, of uh, Voga, Vanishing Voices of Great Andamanis that I conducted. So you are one of the silent supporters uh, and a very big admirer of the project. So thank you very much for encouraging me and always being in uh, tune and sync with my work so that uh, I have known, uh, I've also got many suggestions from you time and again. And this suggestion of yours really is very timely and uh, let me, it appears to be very significant. Why did I not think of it? I, and uh, I am, uh, I have just started making an audio book, but not of Andamanis. You know, my parents were very famous uh, literary people. I belong to a family of Hindi writers and uh, I have um, been, uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of getting um, autobiography of my mother that she wrote. Uh, basically on my father's, it's a biography of my father, Bharat Bhushan Agarwal in Hindi. And I'm in, so I know the whole setup in Delhi, who, who does the audio books and 
and who produces them and how much it costs and what or not. But it never struck me that I can uh, convert this book into an audio book. So now since you've given me the suggestion, let me think about it. I'll have to dig in my audio material of Now Junior. You see, he was a very soft speaker. And the, the material that I have submitted to ELDP, you can make out he sometimes spoke so softly that I had many times I had to ask him to repeat. But I'm sure that can be, can be uh, managed. And I'll have to get back to my original recording to get the Andamani Hindi. And uh, if not in his voice, yes, maybe one of, uh, because it, audiobooks are produced in the, you know, very uh, good quality soundproof rooms. You know so, what, what, what might be interesting, actually, you have young, uh -huh. you've got the young people there who've just now expressed their enthusiasm. Um, uh -huh. if, it's, if it's possible to work with them, because their, their uh, first language is going to be Anamani Hindi. Um, That's right you know, work with them and, and actually their voices could be the ones which, uh, you know, are form the component for the audio book. If, if it were possible to arrange for, you know, for them to be recorded, uh, it, there would be a certain level of, of work and training that was necessary, but yeah, that, yeah. Would be a, that would be a fantastic way to engage with the local community who have mm -hmm. this uh, new enthusiasm, as you said. But it's great that you're thinking about that, and and um, you know all the best with the with the forthcoming biography that you were telling us about. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, let me see how feasible it is because uh, Andamanese kids are not uh, allowed to travel outside the Andaman Islands by the government of India for recording. One would, but it can be arranged in the in the radio station of uh, Port Blair. I'm sure. Something of this sort. So let me let me think about it and get going. You know, this is you have uh, really kindled my interest into it, <laughs> and let me see how feasible it becomes. But uh, it it certainly is doable. I think it's doable. So so that's one good thing the, that come uh, up now, and uh, I'll have to take your help, and I have to also seek help of the administration to do this because, as you know, for any any little thing. Any little uh, recording or interview or any anything you have to do with the the tribes, you have to take go through rigmarole of a lot of uh, you know uh, passes and permissions by the administration. But it is it is doable. Thank you, Peter, for the suggestion. Thank you very much. Um, we have just uh, three minutes left, I think, and there's a. a Comment in the chat. Uh, Gregory Hamovich says thank you very much, and and and, uh, and uh, um, yes, I kind of replies to that. But um, what, um, Wale or Gunlaye um, from Nigeria, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Do you have a question for Professor Abi? He has a question for you, uh -huh. Julia. Okay. Um, well, actually, um, ELDP is no longer based at SOAS. So, uh, we don't actually have funding. But um, while it, well, if you want to talk at some point, we, uh, there are also um, people nowadays more and more are using things like mobile phones for, for language documentation. Yeah. Uh, much, there are much cheaper ways than, than trying, to have, trying to invest in expensive material uh, equipment. Um, perhaps you know, try to try to get around the need for for extra money and and, and look at the kind of equipment that people have already. Um, we're talking about the young people in the Andamanese. Often, young people are now digital natives. They're very used to using their mobile phones. But all sorts of things that I'm not familiar with. Um, so maybe that might be one way forward uh, to get people involved in in language documentation themselves. Anyway, I think that's right. It's a separate conversation. Okay, um, but. Um, Joey, do you want to come back at this point to, to round things up? Yeah, well, I'll just come back to say thank you to you, Julia, for, for being here, for being part of this conversation and bringing your perspective. And of course, to Professor Abby for being here to share with us about her story, her experience, and even the, the recent news about new interest in the language and the islands as well. That's really exciting. So thanks, everyone, for being a part of this conversation. And just a reminder to everyone that the book is called Voices from the Lost Horizon. You can look it up online. If you're in the UK, it's a very affordable uh, Kindle version you can get if you download it from Amazon. 
Otherwise, search for, for it online wherever books are sold. It's available on Amazon in UK, no problem. That's right. And, and probably, probably in other countries too, I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay well, th thank you so much, Anvita. It's it great talking to you. And, and as Peter Austin says, um, we, uh, I think the whole world should be very grateful for your, for your really dedicated work of, over the last 20 years and more, well, up for actually the last 50 years, really. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, this is just a glimpse of a civilization, very ancient civilization. I have done a very, very small part. I wish I was there 20 years ago. Mm, I mean, yeah. 20 years before when I went. It's, it's, Thank it's, you very it's, much it's, for giving me this opportunity to all of you. And thanks to all the participants who attended this. I'm very happy this morning, my morning. <laughs> <laughs> and this evening here. Thank you so much.